Good afternoon, KISA members. It's very nice to be your host this afternoon. Um, thanks for making it the time. And also, thank you so much for your interest in KISA and also this uh, talk that we will be having from Zena Jardine this afternoon. Just before we begin, just a few quick house rules. Um, let's uh, maybe keep the cameras off, except for the person presenting and also the microphones we can keep off. If uh, people have any questions, they are most welcome to enter them into the chat box, and then uh, we will collect those questions and ask them to Zena at the end of the meeting. Zena informed me her talk will be about 40 minutes. Um, so uh, it wouldn't be too long. I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. So just a little bit more about our speaker of this afternoon. This is, um, as I mentioned, uh, Zena Jardin. She is the head of education at Sef SAFMED, a very well-respected company in South Africa, a medical company. And um, Zena is a clinical specialist in decontamination, and she holds a nursing master's degree from the University of the Witwatersrand. And before joining SAFMED, she held a position of theater unit manager for 10 years. Zena has presented at, very, at a variety of congresses in her speciality areas, which is operating room sciences and the decontamination of medical devices. And she's currently the chairperson of the CSSD forums of South Africa. She also represents the, C the CSSD forums of South Africa at the World Federation for Hospital Sterilization Services at the South Africa Bureau of Standards Technical Committee. Um, yeah, and then Zena is also a member of the Central Sterilization Club in the United Kingdom. So we are really dealing here with somebody that knows everything about the field of cleaning and state decontamination. Zena, without further ado, over to you. We really look forward to your amazing talk. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Excellent. So I'm going to turn my video off now in a second so that we can concentrate on the slides. So thank you very much for uh, for allowing us to chat today, uh, focusing on the decontamination of flexible endoscopes. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful in terms of the position that I'm in. I, I, I'm exposed to a, a huge amount of local and international standards. Um, and local and international guidelines and local and international people who focus in this area. So uh, thankfully for that, uh, it gives me um, exposure, experience, and, and hopefully some knowledge that I can that I can share with you today. So turning off my video and focusing now on the slides. What are we going to cover today? So. Let's explain things. Or there are about five, that was it. Okay, firstly, I wanna talk about why this topic is so very, very important. We'll have a brief look at what standards and guidelines there are overall, a brief touch on the international updates, and we'll focus quite a lot on what, what has been updated in the South African standards. Um, and then we'll finish off with just reminding ourselves of thinking a little bit deeper about how a clinical engineer can help us uh, in this endeavor. And ultimately, what we want to do and we want to achieve is to decontaminate this device, this complex, complex device, in a way that makes it really, really safe for the patient. And of course, that everybody else who's involved with handling or dealing with them are also safe. Now, flexible endoscopes, I'm sure a lot of you know, are really and truly unique. And the design is incredibly complex. Um, is this whole thing around human error because there is a large component of that scope cleaning and decontamination and reprocessing that is a manual process and it is prone to human error. It's heavily soiled because of you know where we put it, the end of the day, the scope is going to become heavily soiled and those contaminants in that soil is not easy soil to remove. Um, and they're a bit hard to see whether they are on clean, they are complex with all sorts of lumens. So it's not an easy solution. If you think about a, a simple um, Kraal's faucet or an artery faucet, it's stainless steel, it's silver in color, it's gonna get contaminated mostly with blood. It's easy to see, it's easy to manage, it's relatively easy to clean, um, and therefore not that, and not that complex in design in the greater scheme of things. But of course, flexible endoscopes, far, far, far more complex. I'm sure a lot of you are well aware of the variety of channels 
uh, that run within the scope as well as all the other bits and pieces that run within the scope. When I'm teaching anybody, especially in the hospital setting, I like to try to focus on some very important aspects. And that for me is the part that we forget about this universal cord. A lot of people are, and a lot of nursing staff are always focused on the insertion tube, but a lot of people forget about this, this uh, universal cord. And that makes me very, very worried. You know, I always like to show them that when the doctor depresses uh, the, the, the valve over here, what's going to happen? You know, if we're looking for air, that air is going to come all the way from the air pump, up the universal cord, out the front of the scope. If we want to suck something, we've got some debris, we've got some feces, we've got some gastric juices uh, that are in the way of the doctor's vision. What's the doctor going to do? He's going to depress the valve. We're following the red line now. Um, the solution, the horrible contaminants are going to come up the scope, down the universal cord and out to the suction connection. And not everybody remembers that. So always very important to bear that in mind that these, these um, channels are well known. Uh, a lot of people, of course, will focus here on the biopsy valve. We know that inlet. We sort of uh, remember that part. We remember the tip of the scope, but not everybody remembers the complexity of it. I like to show things like these pieces and bits and bobs so that we can understand exactly what is inside the scope. I mean, all these pieces that make up a scope are absolutely phenomenal. Um, I like to show people what's in that co that polymer cover. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there, huge amount of things contained in there, angulation-wise, um, CCD uh, signal-wise, uh, the Barbsy channel itself, the ones we're familiar with, uh, the water channels, uh, the light guard fiber, the, uh, fibers, all of these components, and they're tightly, tightly packed, in essence, within this, and everything's got to work together. And um, everything's so close together. So if we get a hole in something, the potential uh, and the consequences of that hole can just be absolutely devastating. Again, to, to reiterate the importance of leak testing when I'm training, I try to remind people to be so careful. We don't always have control of what's going inside the channel. The doctor's working. He wants to take a biopsy. He grabs the biopsy forces, shoves it in. Um, if there's a little bit of a kink or something that's that's uh, occluding, uh, he might push a little bit harder. When you look again, you've got a hole in the biopsy channel. And that, of course, can end up um, with ingress and ingress of a, a multitude of things. So it's not just the potential for water getting into the into the scope itself, but it's the potential for gastric juices, for feces, uh, for respiratory uh, uh, excretions and secretions. And that is absolutely awful. So we're going to corrode and damage the scope. Uh, of course, we're now looking at all the electronics that are potentially going to get damaged. And then there's that whole infection risk. We've got all of this horrible, horrible gunk inside that scope. And is there a chance that it, that ends up in the next patient? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, there is a chance. And that's why these uh, devices are so risky. I think one of the first published papers that um, that stood out for me was was back in 2013, and this was a published paper by Ofsted of um, et al. Ofsted has done a tremendous amount of work and published uh, a huge amount of work on endoscopes, endoscope cleaning, and some uh, really good training uh, material as well. And this was the statement made me quite nervous. And Ofsted stated that contaminated endoscopes have been linked to more healthcare-associated infections than any other medical device. And that was the starting point where I also started to get very, very interested in scopes. Now, there are numerous published papers. I promise you I could be here for three hours just referring to all of the published papers that exist on, uh, on uh, the potential for transmission of infection relating to, uh, to contaminated scopes. Here's a few headlines. Carbapenem resistant interbacteriaceae uh, and endoscopy, an evolving threat. Transmission of uh, carbapenem resistant interbacteriaceae during ERCP. Is it time to revisit the reprocessing guidelines? Could biopsy ports be a source for potential flexible endoscope contamination? What about Klebsiella pneumonia, an outbreak associated with an endoscope? Again, 
scary, scary concepts. This particular um, uh, published paper, I quite liked this one, scary as it was, published in 2020. Um, and, and this is part of some of the modern advancements in terms of uh, identifying issues with scopes. It includes the potential for examining, uh, especially the biopsy working channels with a bore scope. In this particular research, um, as you can see uh, from the University of Pittsburgh um, and that area is where the published paper came from, they examined the working channels using a bore scope and they sent samples away for, micro, uh, for um, microbial culture. They found multiple abnormal abnormalities, including all sorts of dents, shredding, debris, and residual water. Bear that point in mind, residual water in these scopes that were clean, ready to use scopes. Then they took some, uh, some samples and, um, and sent them all for testing. And 28% of the bronchoscopes, 22% of the GI scopes, and 30% of the urology scopes tested positive for gram-positive microorganisms. Now, that is not something that we want to happen in our hospitals. That's not something that we want to subject our patients to. So not only are the scopes potentially harmful for the patients, but what about us that are dealing with them and looking after them and managing them? What can we do to protect ourselves? Um, I think a lot of people would have heard about the, the, the outbreaks that were associated with geodenoscopes. That was sort of the, the first scopes really that were identified as a huge problem uh, in the media. It's not the first scopes ever, but it became quite um, uh, well versed because it, all this information got out to the to the media. If you go to the FDA website, you can always take a look at the list of actions that they've taken to try to deal with these issues and safety alerts and where they've ordered post-market surveillance from the manufacturers of scopes, where they've sent out warning letters to various manufacturers and continuous involvement in terms of trying to improve things at that time focusing on geodenoscopes. I apologize to Olympus. It just happened to be one of the headlines. It's not the only um, uh, manufacturers that, that had some issues around this. Um, but this became an issue. We had um, news headlines. or You can see this new he news headline just from 2023. These devices sickened hundreds. The new models have risks too. Um, they're not nice when things like this happen. Your scope or your or the devices that you're dealing with with your patients on a, on a daily basis end up in the news headlines, or for that matter, in the court cases. In this particular court case here, um, from what I understand from the, from the news headlines at the end of the day, both the hospital and the manufacturer were held liable um, in this regard because they had stated in that particular instance that the manufacturer's instructions weren't sufficient, um, but the hospital themselves didn't follow all of the manufacturer's instructions. And that, I think, is something we need to really and really truly take into cognizance is it's not only the manufacturer's instructions, it's about, it's about us following them. And do we actually know what they are and have we listened carefully? Um, do we have written instructions? Do we follow them? Just to remind us, because now we're talking about geodenoscopes, I've got a little video over here. Um, it's a clinical video. It's about four minutes long. Just to remind us, of course, of what we do with that scope when we're doing an ERCP, just to get an idea on that, on that anatomy uh, and that clinical approach. ERCP is a therapeutic procedure performed in a patient with symptoms, abnormal findings by CT scan, MRI, ultrasound, or X-ray, together with abnormal lab results. In the pancreatic duct, in an effort to relieve pain, ERCP is most commonly used to obtain tissue, remove stones, and drain fluid collections when symptoms are present. Pain in chronic pancreatitis can be caused by pancreatic duct obstructions from stones, strictures, infections, or compression from fluid collection. In the biliary tree, ERCP is frequently used to remove bile duct stones and to bypass obstructions that can be benign or malignant. ERCP is also used to treat strictures, infections such as cholangitis, leaks after surgery such as gallbladder removal, and to obtain tissue samples in the form of biopsy or cytology.
ERCP is generally performed as an outpatient procedure, but on occasion it is performed when the patient is in the hospital for an acute problem. Gastroenterologists may work alongside anesthesiologists to provide sedation. A local anesthetic may be applied as a spray to your throat to numb the gag reflex. Your vital signs will be closely monitored throughout the procedure. The procedure may be short or lengthy, depending on the complexity of the case. A mouthpiece will be used to protect both your teeth and the scope. The ERCP scope is inserted into the mouth, passed through the esophagus, into the stomach and duodenum. Air is insufflated to distend the duodenum and allow visualization. Once the scope is in the duodenum, the major papilla is located. It is important to note that secretions from both the pancreas and the bile duct jointly drain into the duodenum through the major papilla. A guide wire and a catheter are inserted through the opening of the papilla to gain access to the pancreatic or bile duct, depending on where the disease lies. Using fluoroscopy, which is a combination of an X-ray machine, guide wire, and contrast dye injected via catheter, the desired duct is cannulated and the doctor is able to identify the problem and provide treatment. If a stone is identified in either the pancreas or biliary tree, it can be removed by cutting the sphincter muscle within the major papilla. This is called a sphincterotomy. The stone is removed by pulling it out of the duct and into the small bowel using a balloon to sweep and clean the duct. It can then pass out safely with the stool. If a blockage or suspicious tissue is observed, a sample can be obtained and sent to the lab for analysis. In the pancreatic duct, when fluid collection, stones, or strictures are present, a plastic stent can be inserted to bypass the obstruction or to drain the fluid. Once the obstruction is bypassed, the normal flow can be re-established. In the bile duct, if a tumor causes blockage and requires drainage, a metal stent, if malignant disease, or plastic stent, if it is unknown if the obstruction is benign or malignant, can be used to bypass the blockage and re-establish the flow into the duodenum. ERCP is more invasive than routine endoscopic procedures and carries risks of complications, including acute pancreatitis in about 5 to 15 percent of cases, depending on the indication. If pancreatitis occurs, hospitalization for a few days is usually required. Other less common complications, particularly if sphincterotomy was performed, include bleeding, infection, perforation, and possibly even death. ERCP. So as you can see, ERCP is a really invasive procedure. If you think about it, we're, we're going in through a really contaminated area. So we're in the bowel and we're going to work into a sterile area of the body. So this becomes quite a complex scenario and can be very, very risky. To get our, um, our scope uh, and to get around this corner over here, up into the biliary tree, for example, or up into the pancreas, we need this mechanism, that elevator. And that elevator is complex. The design of the tip of this type of scope is very, very complex. And, and making sure that the elevator is properly raised so that we can get underneath there to clean thoroughly is very, very, very important and not necessarily simple. But what do I see in the field? And I'm sure those of you who have been in the operating room or are involved in scopes in some way, they've seen all sorts of things happening in the, in the field. Um, scopes are often not fully immersed. Um, the control body is often not cleaned. A lot of focus, as I said, on the insertion tube, and we forget about the universal cord. Sometimes we call it, of course, the umbilicus. Not having the correct accessories is really, really terrible. Still using horrible metal buckets like this can really and truly damage our scopes. And of course, at the end of the day, it means we will not uh, clean them thoroughly or properly. We all know that it's very, very important, and hopefully we all know that no matter what device it is that you're trying to clean or decontaminate or high-level disinfect or sterilize, 
whatever the process is, that you need to follow the manufacturer's instructions for use. Absolutely critical. So in research conducted in the South African setting, we looked at a few of the steps, not every single one of them, but some of the basic steps that one would hope would have been performed. Let's have a look at them and uh, let's see what these uh, results were. Was the outer tube washed? Mm, yeah, about 80% of the time. Were the valves removed? Very seldom. Did we actually suck through the detergent fluid mix? Did we brush the valve port? Very seldom. You can see over there brushing the biopsy channel. That was often done quite well. Brushing in the other channels, purely done. Uh, attaching the actual accessories that are supplied and uh, in the instructions for use, Nope, not done often. Was the scope fully submerged like it's supposed to be? Nope, uh, we didn't do that often. Did we rinse the outer tube after cleaning? 100% done. That's the one thing that we did all the time consistently in this particular research. And the work that I've done um, in, in, in a private health care setting at the moment, I'm seeing that on a, well, it depends, I guess, I'm, I'm going to generalize now, but about 30% of all the scopes I've ever tested have come back positive for residual proteins. These cleaning accessories are very important. I mean, if you haven't, if you've read the instructions for use, it'll clearly describe how you're supposed to be using all of these cleaning accessories. Um, and hopefully people have been properly trained. When were they trained? Who did the training? How often are they trained? Did one individual train the next individual because they've been working there for a year and there was a new person on board, so they trained them themselves? Did they forget some steps in the process? And how long did that training take? Was it at seven o'clock in the morning with a muffin and a quick, a quick cup of tea and a, and a quick demo? Or was it more than that? Because really and truly it does need to be a lot more than that. And the, the national standards, the South African standards, call for not only training, but for competency assessments. Now we ask ourselves, who's responsible for doing that? A good question. Okay, so I said today we wanted to focus on why is this topic important. So hopefully I think I've laid that, that uh, groundwork for you. Uh, we've had a look at some of the published papers, just a few of the numerous published papers that are out there about the potential of transmission of infection from one patient to the next from a poorly decontaminated, reprocessed flexible endoscope. There have been deaths, there have been outbreaks of infections, there have been a multitude of injuries to patients from poorly decontaminating flexible um, endoscopes. So what standards and guidelines are there? This is a list of guidelines that were reviewed when we looked at the South African National Standards. So the South African National Standard, the SANS 373, uh, was updated. It took us a few years to do that. There were a number of people on that committee, um, end users, uh, nursing, uh, a, a few gastroenterologists, microbiologists, infection control staff, people that work in GI units, uh, theater matrons, um, as well as representatives from the manufacturers in South Africa of the makes and models and brands of, of scopes that we see in the South African setting. And these are the list of, of uh, standards that were reviewed, or at least mm, most of them. There may have been a few more, in fact. What are the international updates? So I'm just briefly referring to some of the international updates because I really want to focus on the South African updates. And when we made the South African updates, uh, we, we certainly went through all of these international uh, guidelines as well. Um, the American multi-society guidelines were updated in 2020, the European ones in 2010, the AORN, the Association of Operating Room Nurses, they updated theirs in 2022, the British Society updated theirs in 2022, and recently, in fact, I've been working with the Scottish guidelines, and if I recall correctly, those were done in 2023. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with ISO 15883, the manufacturing standard that covers washer disinfectors. As you know, part one covers the general requirements for all uh, makes and models of washer disinfectors. 
Part four is specific to endoscope washer disinfectors, and part five covers the test methods that we use to demonstrate the cleaning efficacy of a washer disinfector. So ISO 15883 part five is being revised as we speak, and um, the final draft has been released, and the commenting needs to uh, be, be completed by June this year. So as a member of the CFSA, I, I represent the CFSA on the South African um, uh, Standards Committee. And South Africa, as you know, SANS is, is um, a signatory to the ISO standards. So we get to read and comment on whether we agree to the standards and what's coming out in those standards. Part four of the standard was revised in 2018 and part five was updated in 2021. So from a South African point of view, those ISO standards, exactly as they are written, without any changes, without any adaptions or adopt adaptations, have been adopted in the South African setting. So SANS 15883 Part 1, uh, Part 3, uh, Part 2, and Part 4, I apologize, are all now adopted in the South African setting. So we are expected to follow that standard as well. Then I want to chat about SANS 373. So SANS 373 is a homegrown standard, and it's a standard about specifically about the reprocessing of endoscopes. And um, there aren't any ISO standards that deal specifically with the reprocessing of endoscopes. The manufacturing standard is an ISO, but not the reprocessing. That's not in as an ISO standard. There is, however, um, a, a project underway uh, to look at a standard, an ISO, an international standard, for how we should be um, uh, doing the testing and the quality assurance and the biological uh, monitoring of flexible endoscope. So that project is on the way at the moment, and we'll keep an eye on that because it might be something that we choose to adopt in the South African setting. So SANS 373 was originally published in 2009. It had two parts to it. Part one was flexible endoscopes and part two was for rigid telescopes. When the update was done, the committee decided that it really wasn't necessary to have a standalone um, a standard for cleaning telescopes or managing telescopes, because in essence, they should be managed as is all other instrumentation, but flexible endoscopes would keep, we would keep as a separate entity. There are nine sections or parts to this particular standard and scope uh, parts one to three will cover all the normal stuff you would find in a standard like the, the what the, the scope of the standard, the terms, the definitions, etc. Part four talks about the requirements. I'll go into a few points on that just now. Part five talks about the structure and design and the components of an endoscope. Here are a few diagrams, so it just makes it a little bit easier to, for everybody to understand the structure. Part five wasn't changed or adapted in any way. That stayed exactly the same. Part six then goes on to describe manual reprocessing. Part seven focuses on automated reprocessing. Part eight focuses on the reprocessing of accessories and part nine focuses on the quality control aspects. So that's the cleaning verification and the biological monitoring. So touching on a few points now, in part four, the reprocessing environment talks about having a, a dedicated room and that reprocessing should take place in a well-ventilated dedicated room dedicated room or an area away from the patient's procedure room. It also goes on to describe a little bit more about the flow and the design of that room, the temperature, the humidity, those kind of aspects. It talks about the fact that we need our wash facilities um, in that area. If anybody should get um, any uh, splashes in the eye, that we can, from an occupational health and safety perspective, um, have, have a facility available for that. There's reference to the, uh, the carry cases, as we know, and I hope that we all know that um, flexible scopes must never be stored, um, certainly not in a hospital setting, in a carry case at all. And that the carry cases are used only for transportation when necessary, but not for, for storage 
uh, between uses. It also goes on to talk about on the, in the section of uh, education, training and competency that all staff should have competency evaluations annually. So it's not just about having one training session every now and again or one training session when you get a new scope. It's about um, A, having a training session, but B, also having some form of competency evaluation. So also in the standard is a, is a generic order tool. Remember I said to you that we, if we are talking about um, uh, training, that that training will also need to be model and make specific. So um, uh, although in this we're referring to, to general training, when somebody's being trained, they need to be trained per each model, per, e, per each make that is specific to each particular device. Very important that we understand that. But after that training, somebody's got to assess whether the individual is now actually competent to be able to do that process. Are they, have they learned it? Have they understood it? And can they actually clean that particular device? The standard doesn't say whose responsibility it is, but it does say that that actually falls under the responsibility of the hospital to ensure that that happens. In this section as well, we also talk about hand, hy hand hygiene, PPE, standard precautions. I have a very nice slide. The next slide will talk a little bit about, about um, splashes. And um, as I also said in this uh, part four, is also the responsibilities of the healthcare facility. In there, we also cover the fact that um, uh, we need a protocol for each procedure, a protocol and a procedure for tracing and recording equipment used on the patient and who reprocessed it. So very important. That's what our national guidelines are saying. This is a very nice published paper from Ofsted. Remember, we saw her publication from 2013. This looks at how far we generate splashes and how much droplet dispersement there is in the department when we're cleaning scopes. So this was um, looking at the manual cleaning in this, in this regard of a colonoscope and a transvaginal ultrasound plant. Probe. And if you look at the images over there, what they did is they took a particular paper material that re uh, will react to, to splashes, change color. So you can see all over the department how far things have, have actually um, splashed. And things could be dispersed, droplets can be dispersed up to two, um, 2.1 meters during the manual cleaning of a colonoscope. So if you think about it, if the only cleaning process is next to the patient's bed, or we are doing all of this right next to the patient's bedside in the operating room, are we not contaminating that area? Is it really the right thing to do? In SANS 373, there is reference to um, uh, pre-cleaning at the bedside or a, or a bedside cleaning process. Um, as it is in all of the other international standards. Hopefully we're not using these horrid metal buckets to do that with. That bedside pre-cleaning uh, process does include wiping down the insertion tube. It does include sucking through the detergent water mix. It does include blowing out air, but of course, all of this still needs to be in line with what the manufacturer's instructions would say. Then it refers to transporting the scope to a designated area for the rest of the process. And that transport is also discussed, how it should be transported in a manner that's closed and contained and safe. Um, but of course, sadly, in some settings, uh, all that happens, especially between cases we see, is the use of these types of buckets uh, in the corner of the theater maybe, uh, where now all of the cleaning and disinfection takes place right there. Often when that is the, the case, we find that things like leakage testing is never done between patients. Um, attachments of all the correct accessories is often not done. And if you think about it, how far are all these splashes generating? Remember, you're taking a colonoscope out of a really dodgy area. It's contaminated. There are feces <laughs> all over your theater now. They have spread at least a meter to two meters around your operating room. That's why there is a call for a dedicated cleaning area and not to do this all in the operating room. These um, accessories uh, and attachments are often missing or gone, or it's just really, really um, can be very scary. Steps tend to be skipped when we're doing processes like this. 
And we've spoken already a little bit about manual uh, manual cleaning and the potential for human error. Quite a few published papers, again, from Ofsted et al. on human error associated with, uh, with the endoscope cleaning. Why do we end up doing that? Well, often because we don't have sufficient inventory. And that is a huge problem. If we don't have the, 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 the numbers of scopes that we need for the turnaround time that we have, for the facilities that we have, we end up cutting the corners and doing these processes in the operating room right next to the patient's bedside, which is really and truly not the idea for them at all. And all international and local standards um, do not call for that. We know that automated reprocessing is the way to go. Automated reprocessing is validatable, verifiable. Um, and if we are doing automated reprocessing, I've just taken a few pointers out of the same standard for now um, that include things like the endoscope washer disinfector, shall comply with ISO SANS 15883 part four, uh, things like the the a uh, washer um, should be fitted with the filters or at least a water treatment um, a process of some sort that the final rinse water is free of bacterial contaminants. Um, the, the endoscope washer disinfector must perform a leak test that of course is part of um, 15883 as well. And wherever possible, um, all endoscopes should be reprocessed using an endoscope washer disinfector and not just a manual process. In the section of quality control, the standard calls for three things, visual inspection, cleaning verification tests, and biological monitoring. I haven't gone into great detail on the biological monitoring today, uh, but there is already a, a process in our standard in how you should take the specimen and what it should be sent off for to the laboratory. Um, we had a microbiologist's input into that, and we may be adapting that now if there is an international standard with some changes to it, we're going to look at that, review it, and see whether it's um, uh, applicable in our country, and hopefully maybe even update and upgrade our own standard around that. Let's look at visual inspection and cleaning verification tests. So a lot of the guidelines internationally, and now our guideline as well, says that when we are doing visual inspection, of course, visually, we can only inspect the exterior of the scope. Aside from looking for damage, um, you know, patients bite them, they get, uh, scopes get damaged. You guys know that probably even better than I do. You've seen all of that damage, but the scope is dark, it's black. Um, it's not always easy to see the contaminants. So the guidelines call for using lighted magnification so that you can look better, you can see better, because really and truly you can't see clearly just with looking with the naked eye. And then, of course, there's the point that we can't see down the lumens. Um, so international guidelines at the moment, or some of them are calling for inspection, inspecting inside the scope using a bore scope. There's some controversy around that because uh, what is, no, not many people have inspected inside the bores anymore uh, or inside the, the, the channels. So how do we know whether that's just a little scratch or a scratch that needs a repair? So there still needs to be some guidelines in the greater scheme of things or going forward in the future as to um, uh, what you're seeing with the ball scope and when there's something that you need to act on from that ball scope. But certainly using ball scopes, we've seen all sorts of debris, contaminants, brushes, uh, an, an amazing amount of things inside the channels of the scopes. The South African guidelines don't go that far, but what they do say is that we need to be using some form of scientific method to verify that the scope channels are in fact thoroughly clean or that the scope itself is thoroughly clean. So it refers to a scientific methodology. Um, and one of those, uh, or an example of one of those methods is in fact a residual protein test. So remember that we have to get a device completely clean before we can put it through the next level of process. Um, in the majority of cases for a flexible scope, of course, it'll be high level disinfection, but there is a call for sterilization on many of the operative scopes. Um, and hopefully in the future or going forward, we'd be able to adopt that as well, um, uh, that, those, that those high risk scopes that are able to be sterilized are in fact sterilized. And for that purpose, we would need low temperature sterilization. Uh, but of course, before we do that, whether it's sterilized or soak in a high-level disinfectant, 
um, or or even possibly sterilize with a with a liquid high level uh, with a, a liquid um, a solution uh, that is also possible and available in some settings. Um, we need to actually make sure it's clean. If it's not clean, remember that debris, that contaminant, that feces, that whatever it is, that uh, bronchial uh, um, solutions and secretions that are in the that could potentially be in the scope are going to hinder the next process. They stick there. We can't get to the the thing. They make biofilms that protect the microorganisms. And at the end of the day, uh, you can do what you like. It's still not going to be high level disinfected or sterilized. So what we like to now do is to try to test whether it was actually cleaned. And one of the ways of doing that is using a scientific method like a residual protein test. So a lot of this, the body fluids are proteinous, protein. So we can use a protein tests to be able to identify that. Now, protein tests are in the, um, the UK standards uh, for all devices. In fact, in the South African setting, protein tests are in the SANS 373 or um, the use of a scientific method, for example, a protein test. Uh, this is an example of one such product. It's a vial with a liquid in it, uh, generally supplied with some smaller swabs, and separately one would then buy um, or, 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 uh, longer testing um, uh, swabs like these. Um, and they, of course, would be available in different diameters, as, of course, we have different diameters to our biopsy channels and working channels, as it were. With the uh, the shorter swabs, you can test the tip of the scope, you can test the biopsy port, you can test the valve ports, um, or any other area of the scope that you are concerned about on from the exterior in essence. Uh, but internally, of course, we need a long, um, a long brush lock um, uh, testing, uh, sw a swab or brush, depending on on what the what the product uh, provides. At the end of the day, you put the um, the tip of of either the swab or the tip of the of the brush into the vial and the vial then changes color. Of course, if that if it is positive for proteins, there is a sliding scales and you can see the image on the left over there. Um, the the vials on the left have have um, have tested there is no uh, residual protein. The more protein there is, the bigger the color change, for example. Look at the images on the right. So these were some colonoscopes that I tested at one particular facility. The first one, the C only, C is the control test. Um, so there is always a positive control provided with that particular product, uh, which is heparinized sheep's blood, um, that you would use as a batch uh, testing to make sure that the batch itself is functioning correctly. C1 over there is the first colonoscope that I tested at this particular facility that it had some issues and they asked for some assistance. Um, so I went to the field and started testing the scopes. Uh, the C1 specimen, in fact, was from the biopsy channel um, of one particular scope. And then C2 was the biopsy channel of one. Uh, no, I lied the other way around. C2 was from the uh, tip of the scope. And C2.2 was that second scope, but inside the biopsy channel. So I picked up residual proteins in, in two of these scopes um, immediately, telling me that those scopes had not been properly cleaned. And as I say, if it's not properly cleaned, it can not be properly processed, as in a high level disinfected or sterilized. This is a geodenoscope, an image of a, of a geodenoscope that I took in a hmm, private healthcare facility in the Cape somewhere. Um, I know for a fact that the staff in this standalone GI unit had recently had training on this particular scope. They'd had it for a month or two. Uh, about a month prior to this testing, a patient had died after ERCP. When I try to raise the, the elevator mechanism, bearing in mind I'm not an expert in everybody's make and model, I, you know, I thought, hell, I don't know how to raise this elevator mechanism. I wonder where it is. Not a member of the staff knew. After a bit of prodding and pulling and a bit of logic, I found the button. And, and there you go, I managed to raise the elevator mechanism and this is all the contaminants I removed. So that tells me in that month or two, nobody had lifted it, nobody had cleaned it. Um, and it was very, very sad to see. That's us putting our patients at risk. Was it the training? No, they had training. Was it the lack of understanding? What was it? Why did we not get it right? 
Science 373 also talks about storage. Um, and it is important, in fact, that going forward, we start to move towards using uh, storage facilities that are compliant with the EN standard 16442. Um, in the South African setting, there are some um, um, uh, facilities that have already done that, which is excellent to see, or some that are using more advanced um, uh, storage facilities, but they aren't, don't know if they are all compliant um, with this particular standard. If all you have is the cupboard, that very sad cupboard, normally made of this white material, uh, then we need to do the best we can, which is very sad, um, and we need to make sure that the scopes are hanging. In this case, of course, they'll be hanging. Um, the first prize uh, would be, as we said, um, a, a, proper, a proper cabinet. If not, we need to make sure that there are no loops whatsoever. So as you can see over here, cupboard A has um, specifically been designed with loops, and those loops are a problem because here in this in this loop, we have the potential for formation of fluid, um, which is really, really great. If you think about it, especially if we haven't cleaned the section nicely, you know, because this is uh, suction uh, materials that, sitting, or that are sitting in there, we have great potential for the formation of biofilms and good, good chance of there being microorganisms in there. Whether we're doing a manual cleaning process or we're doing an automated cleaning process in heaven, or hopefully we've now moved to the automated cleaning process, that we have all the right cleaning accessories. All the manual stuff we will need anyway, and all the automated stuff, all the correct hookups, so that we can get the right process done. Another important uh, published paper I want to talk about for a second is this, and that's about the increasing potential risk of, contam of contamination from repetitive use of endoscopes. Um, so this paper talks to the fact that the more often you use a, sco a scope, the greater the chance that there are alterations um, and, and damage to the scope itself, um, especially obviously on the channels. With that, a greater chance of microorganisms and biofilms in the scope. Uh, we know that a typical lifespan of a scope can be five to 10 years, uh, according to the, the published paper, of course. Um, but what happens if we've got very little inventory? At the end of the day, we're using that same scope over and over and over and over and over and over again. So it's not lasting its lifespan that it should be lasting. We're damaging it repeatedly. And there is a great chance wherever there's a little scoration or a bit of damage um, that you can't necessarily see uh, that, uh, in fact, that particular scope is now problematic. I was in a unit uh, the one day uh, with... We, we did the first case with one scope and we thankfully had a second scope uh, for the second case. The first uh, scope, the scope was clean after uh, testing it with for residual proteins. After the cleaning phase, before the disinfection, it was actually clean. Scope number two, the individual, the nurse doing the, the procedure who did the cleaning, did exactly the same steps as she did after the first case. And no matter what she did, the scope still tested positive residual proteins. She didn't do anything wrong. She didn't do anything different. The first scope, she got clean, but the second scope just wouldn't come clean. Why? It was older. It was a far older scope versus the first one. So good chance that there was a little bit of scoration somewhere within the scope that there's build up um, and we can't get in there to get everything out. So very dangerous. Again, another important reason why inventory matters. If we sum it all up, and I think I think all of these things that I'm, I'm alluding to now are really and truly logical, um, how can the clinical engineer help? The clinical engineering hopefully um, can help us make sure that we have all the right equipment that we need, uh, that we have the right volume of equipment that we need, and that everything that we buy is compliant with the correct standard. Hopefully, um, the clinical engineer can make sure that we have all the relevant attachments, accessories, leakage testers, et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully the clinical engineer can play a role in, in, in motivating and help us get an environment, an environment that is dedicated and suitable and in line. The design of that environment is in line with SANS 373, that we've got unidirectional flow, that we're not got crossover and potential contamination in that particular room. And not everybody has a, a separate dedicated room, but hopefully we can motivate to get to one. 
hopefully you guys can also help us with um, uh, inventory, making sure that we have sufficient scopes, uh, that anything that's damaged gets repaired, gets replaced. Um, I know it's not easy. We have budget constraints and all of these things to bear in mind. But ultimately, what I'm trying to, to, to get across is that all of these things have a potential impact on the patient's outcome at the end of the day. If there's possibility or opportunity for on-the-spot training to help liaise with suppliers, I think these are all things in, in my mind where a clinical engineer could help. Uh, perhaps you have other areas or other ways that you, you, you think you can also help. So please do, do teach me as well. So that's pretty well me. And what have we covered today? As I said, we've looked at some of the published papers. We've looked at the standards. We've looked, taken a bit more of a look at the SANS 373 and um, a brief discussion on how I believe the clinical engineer can help. Thank you. Sure, Zena. All I can say is thank you so much. This was truly such a educational talk and actually quite inspiring lesson to your knowledge on the topic. Um, yeah, I must say, uh, as a clinical engineer myself, it is shocking to see sometimes when flexible scopes come in for repair, how, how poorly they are clean. Um, and one has to ask yourself, where do we go wrong in the industry? Like you asked, easy training, easy to lack of understanding because training is done. But at the end of the day, I think you've also given us some good pointers as clinical engineers, what we could do to assist our healthcare facilities better. So thanks very much for this talk. Uh, funnily enough, my... Uh, um, fellow colleague in the industry, David, asked a question, you answered that. I had a question, for example, about correct storage. You covered that in great detail, so no need to ask a question there. There's just then one question from Cindy Ra Sydney Rakobo, who's asking if, um, do you recommend testing the biopsy cap Does thus form part of the scope in use? You're muted, I think. Absolutely. They, in fact, um, uh, today I was reviewing some published papers that have come out recently on um, retention of specimens in the biopsy caps. Um, so it's, it is, is well known and, and heard of, and it, it, there are all sorts of potential uh, implications of retained um, um, tissue in the biopsy cap, as well as um, false specimens at the end of the day. You know, if there's a little piece of something left in there, we haven't cleaned it properly, put the scope in the next patient, you take that out for biopsy, it ends up going away, and you get a diagnosis of some cancer, but it was actually patient number one and not patient number two. Um, no. So yes, very, very important to uh, to test the biopsy caps as well. Thank you for that That's question, amazing. Sydney. Yeah, then, of course, a new topic on everybody's lips these days. Uh, what's your view on disposable scopes is also a question here from our audience this afternoon. Yeah, so there's been lots of, again, a few published papers around disposable scopes. Um, uh, pros and cons, they've been, I've seen some stuff talking about disposable tips, some that are for it, some that are concerned about them, some incidences where they've fallen off, some where they've worked very, very well. And then there's the sustainability issue. So then there are others that are concerned about the sustainability issue. Um, so very difficult to form an opinion um, around this, but we know that they do exist. And and if they if they are good for patient safety, that's something that one should be would be considering. But of course, took you looking at the overall picture. Marvelous. Yeah, well, um, I don't see any more questions in our chat box, Anna. So my uh, Giza colleague, uh, Peter, will be twisting your arm tomorrow to see if we can make this amazing training presentation available to our members. But uh, And then we will communicate it to our um, members. But in the meantime, uh, I, I thought I'll just mention this because I know people would have enjoyed this talk and people would like to reference back to this talk. So um, once we get your heads up tomorrow or so, then we will communicate whatever the answer is on that. And um, to everybody else, thanks for tuning in. And thank you so much for your time and your expertise sharing with us, Anna. It is really appreciated. And then, of course, Kiza, we look forward to the next talk, which will be hosted soon. Thanks for making the time and your interest and all the best for the month to come. Take care and goodbye.